Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Revelation chapter 7. Um, that number is interesting, and it's going to fit into some of the things we're going to discuss today. Uh, we've talked about in Revelation chapter 7 the, uh, the enumeration and the sealing of the 12 tribes of Israel. We've talked about why, why no Dan, how, where'd, where'd Dan go? Um, and then we talked about uh, just the 12,000 from each tribe. We've dealt with the number 12 and that theme and so on. And now we're going to, and, and I love this because God puts them both together in the same chapter of the Bible, which is the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. And you're going to see that this number seven, um, I think it has meaning here, especially that this particular scenario is in the seventh division of the book of Revelation. It's, ah, Pastor Mike, you know, these chapters were not in the original, blah, 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 blah. I know. I know that. But they're here now. And <clears throat> when John described in 1 John the word of life that we have handled. He wasn't just referring to the original manuscripts, which most people in the whole world that have ever read a Bible have never touched the original manuscripts. We can't touch them now if we want them to. They don't exist anywhere that we know of. And so we are handling right now the word of life. And I believe that everything about this book is, is, is in order. There is nothing about this book in my humble honest opinion and that opinion is based upon what I see in the scriptures there is nothing about this book that is the product of man it is the product of God through mankind and every word that it has and I would say including the the matrix or the layout that it that it's in that's just that's just what I see and so here we have the seventh division of the book of Revelation, and we have two groups here that are uh, being spoken of. We have, and, and this is the, uh, the whole idea behind the gospel and what God's intention was. We have Israel, we have the non-Israelite people from all over the world, people who, they didn't descend from one of the 12 tribes, they didn't descend from Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. They, have, they cannot point back to either one of those and say, that was my forefathers. That would include me and probably you, um, we descended from some other line. Those lines are talked about in uh, Genesis chapter 10. You can read about all the divisions of the particular races of men that stem from the three sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. By the way, there are, if you just want to look at mankind itself, there are three primary races of men. There is Caucasoid there is Negroid, and there is Mongoloid. And the sub-races of men, like the American Indian, or the Samoans, or the, um, the, the Indian people from India, Pakistan, and that area, uh, people who came up through the Caucasus Mountains, that would be white Caucasians, uh, and varying, varying traits among races and sub-races all go back to those three major races. Uh, why am I talking about that? Because here we have, in uh, Revelation 7, we have that what we see now is the salvation. The salvation, the sealing with the Holy Spirit of God, the seven spirits, as it were. Um, <clears throat> we have the sealing of the Holy Spirit of, among the twelve tribes. Uh, but what about those people who are not part of the twelve tribes? There's hope for us, and it's not just an afterthought. It's not just... Well, I thought Israel was going to worship me. How come they're not? I don't know who to... Hey, I'll get you over here. That, it wasn't just an afterthought with God. And here's what I like about this. This is the, the foreknowledge of God. God already knows who is going to be saved and who isn't going to be saved. And I believe in choice, and I believe that's part of God's election process, is that he knows our choices. Um, but God already knows who these people are, and you're going to see that here. So in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, here's what the Bible says. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. I like that. A great multitude, which no man could number, of, and here we have the word, all. A-L-L. -L. Does that leave anybody out. And in, in talking about this just for a few minutes today, 
Uh, I'm going to try to knock you out of your racism and your bigotry, okay? Um, now, I am not a flaming liberal that says uh, all the racism men can just get along and live in peace and harmony and blah, blah, blah. There are cultural differences between, between groups of people. And to be honest with you, we all of us, no matter what race of man we are from, we are more comfortable with people who are of our own kind than we are with other people. There are exceptions to this. I understand that. That in itself is not racism. It's not bigotry. It's not hatred of somebody else because of their culture or how they like their food or this and that and the other. I, um, I spent some time, uh, as many of you know, last summer in Kenya, and I have a profound and deep love for those people, for, for all of Africa, but it's particularly the people that I met, the people that I worshiped with, the people whose homes I went and, and ate in. Now, I didn't like some of the food, okay? Some of their manners and customs were kind of strange to me, okay? Uh, I'll give me for an instance. I like to be punctual. If you tell me, hey, hey, Mike, be here at 8 o'clock, I'm going to be there at 7.30 just because, okay? Just so that I'm there at 8 o'clock and I know I'm going to be there at 8 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> and that's how I am. I have found that in a, a, a lot of Kenyans, uh, clock, Okay, you say be here at 11 o'clock, they'll, they'll be there around 1, 1 1.30, 2, something like that, okay? Uh, and that's just, you know, the difference between maybe me and, and some of them. But I have a profound love for them. And I met people over there that I regard as a brother or sister in Christ irregardless of their skin color, their accent, irregardless of the, some of the weird food that they have, irregardless of how they build their houses or what they do for on whatever, irregardless of that, I have a profound love for them because I met brothers and sisters in the Lord. I met people who love Jesus and they're glad that they're saved even though they're not Jews. They're glad that they're saved. And so after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, if you want to look at the Greek word here, nations is ethnos. That's where we get the word ethnic. Diverse kinds of people. And nations generally, generally nations are divided up by ethnicity. Okay, that's generally how it is. Of course, we're moving into a, a new world now where we're trying to break down all the barriers between the peoples. It, it won't work. Um, but anyway, all nations. Um, I would primarily address this to the guy, and I haven't heard from him from a, in a while, and I'm not really concerned about that, from the guy who sends me hate mail. He sent me probably 10, 12 letters in the past telling me that uh, he, shame on me for trying to preach the gospel to black people. Uh, because everybody knows that Jesus sent the 70 disciples. He didn't send them to the Gentiles. He sent them out uh, to the lost uh, sheep of the house of Israel. And of course... He's one of them because he's white and Caucasian. Okay, he's one of he is he belongs to this Christian identity movement. And if you do a little study into this thing, you you'll soon realize that if you're not white and your hair's not the right color and your eyes don't look like they should, a little green, a little hazel, a little blue in there. If you don't have all the right little features, there's no way in the world God loves you. God hates you. That's that's what they say. And so to just to show me how bad a Christian I am and how good a Christian he is, he sends me a gospel track called The Burning Hell, and then he sends me, and I started having my wife or my daughter open the, open the mail, he sends me a pornographic picture of a very large black woman, just to, just to show me how good a Christian he is. Um, these, these people that run around. Christian identity, British Israel, it goes by different names and different ideas. But it asserts that because we're white Caucasian and we, dis we find our heritage from Scotland, Ireland, England, maybe you know Denmark and places like that, uh, then we're the real t lost tribes of Israel. This is why God has blessed us so much, because of our skin color. I don't like you people. <clears throat> um, it's of all nations, all nations, okay, no matter what they are. 
and kindred. Do you know what is embedded, what, what secret is embedded in the word kindred? The word kind. All kinds. Kindred. Um, we have an expression. Um, this fellow over here, uh, yeah, we're kin. We're kin folk. You know what that means? That somewhere up the line, I had a I had a forefather, and they had a forefather that was the same guy. Okay, we might be second cousins, we might be whatever. Uh, I have found that when I go to Arkansas, which is where my family is from, and I find a hoggard, I'll sit and talk with him for a while to find out that there's a guy right here that is our our common forefather. We are kin, kindred kind people, kinds of people. So all nations and kindreds. It doesn't leave out any group or any ethnicity in the world. It doesn't leave anybody out. All nations and kindreds and people and tongues. Think about that. Let me, um, let me say this. Okay, I, I never pass this up. The opportunity to tell you that I believe that the Bible has been correctly, here we go, translated. God, it, it, here again, it's not an afterthought with God. Isaiah 28, verse 11, okay? With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. So God said at some point, I'm not going to speak Hebrew anymore. That's what he said. Then Paul takes that verse by inspiration of the Holy Ghost and expounds on it. In 1 Corinthians 14, with men of other tongues and other languages. Other, plural, languages, many. The day of Pentecost. They were not sitting around on the day of Pentecost speaking the original Hebrew. Okay? They were speaking languages of the people who were gathered around. There's 17 of them. I just happened to count that. There's a reason why. But 17 languages of the people that were gathered around there. And they said, you know what? We're all hearing now in our own language in our own tongues, in our own tongues, in our own languages, from our birth, we're hearing the wonderful works of God. God always intended to start with Israel, then go to all the nations and kindreds and peoples and families and tongues, and then go back to Israel. That's what he always intended to do, and that's what he's in the process of doing right now. So no matter what language is spoken, no matter what skin color they have, no matter what weird food they put in their mouth, no matter if they sleep on beds or sleep standing up or sleep on the ground or whatever, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're human beings. All of their lineage goes back to and and this... Ugh. The people say, hey, Pastor Mike, do you believe the uh, serpent seed idea where uh, Cain was like this, he, the devil slept with Eve and produced Cain? And you know what that is? That's another form of racism. Uh, the, the serpent seed through Cain ideology is still trying to get at the fact that if you're black, you're, you're the devil. Okay? You're not going to be saved. See, this whole idea of salvation in the hands of one race is very, very, very dangerous. I've even heard pastors who've told me, uh, uh, Pastor Mike, I went to pastor a church in a certain area, wanted to start a bus ministry. They said, yeah, Pastor, we're for them bus ministries. What, what, what do you want to do a bus ministry for? Well, I'm going to go pick up little children, bring them to church, and teach them the gospel. Well, Pastor, we just don't want you bringing in little black kids into our church because they ain't got souls. Um, believe it or not, there's still people who, who believe that still. And it's as ungodly and as unbiblical as all get out. This is one of the reasons why we have left a denomination, because a segment of that denomination is racist to the core, and I won't be any part of it. No, I'm not some flaming liberal. I'm just telling you that everybody from all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues, they're going to be saved. And, and, and I want you to get this. Um, this is the book of Revelation. This is looking forward to a particular point when they're all standing around the throne. Did you know that this right here shows the, the foreknowledge of God? John is seeing all of these people, this great multitude that has been saved. He's seeing it even before they were saved. He's seeing it. And this is just the beauty of the scriptures. It is a book of prophecy. It is a book of accurate prophecy. 
So here we have, and, and I haven't even got into the enumeration of them. Yeah, I, I like this, okay? Because you know me. If I see a list of something in the Bible, I'm going to go, let's see, one, two, three. I'm going to count that list. Why? Revelation 13, 18. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number. Ecclesiastes 7. Solomon said, I sought after wisdom. Lo, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find the account. And I just believe, why, why didn't the Bible just say people out of every place in the world is going to be saved? It goes out of its way to say nations, kindreds, tongues, oh, I missed one, people, and tongue. Four groups. Four groups. Think about it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know what that means? It worked. What are you talking about, Pastor Mike? Matthew, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, unto every living creature. Okay? Um, nations, kindreds, people, and tongues are now standing before the throne of God. It worked. Jesus took the, the, the disciples, gave them the, the, what we call the Great Commission. It started, in, he said, in Acts chapter 1. He said, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And then the uttermost parts of the world. There's four, again, right there. So the four Gospels go out in Jerusalem first, then Judea, then Samaria. If you study the book of Acts, that's exactly how it happened. Okay, uh, Judea, Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world. Now that gospel is still being preached. The time is not up yet. Jesus even prophesied, and, this, and the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached unto the entire world, and then shall the end come. And so here we have, what I see is the fruition of what Jesus said. It worked. He sent his word and his word did not return void. And now we have a great multitude which no man can number. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. I want to read just a few verses here. And I have, uh, I have three pages of notes and I don't know if I'm going to get to all of them today. I, I'm just having so much fun here with the fact that a little boy from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, um, who just, I'm just a kid is all I am, and yet God saved me by his wonderful and his marvelous grace. Um, and in fact, if, you, if we were to judge by last names, okay, um, Hoggard, that means that somewhere back in England, somewhere, my forefathers were they kept pigs. They watched pigs. Okay, unclean animals, dirty, nasty job. So I wasn't of the royalty of the British crown. I wasn't anything like that, and nobody in my family was. Um, and yet God just took a little boy and He saved him, saved his mom, saved his dad. And um, I, I just thank God for that. That though I was not counted as far the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet God, through his love for me, and said, you know what, um, Mike, you're not a Jew, but wow, I love you anyway. And I, over my life, has responded to God's calling and God's love. And because of that, because of that, I believe that when I see Revelation 7, verse 9, of all these people gathered around the throne... I, I, I'm, I want to be one of those people. That's what I... I don't want to be on the throne. I want to be the, one of the ones standing in front of the throne. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, an ensign, like a, 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 a banner, okay, uh, uh, of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Now, it's always understood when you read the Scriptures that the word Gentiles applies to those who are not Jews. Paul used that term um, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And here he would be using the term Greek um, to describe those who were 
not Jews, okay? In the Old Testament, they would use the word Gentile, or <laughs> they would just say it how it's supposed to be said. They would say, the heathen, okay? That's us. We're Gentiles. We're heathens. We, 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 would, we would be referred to as the Greeks in the days of Paul. We were anybody who was not an Israelite by birth, okay? Um, to, the, to it shall the Gentiles seek. They, they went running to the sign, and I believe that's an emblem of the Scriptures. By the way, in Isaiah chapter 11, let me turn there, because um, we, here we have the promise of the root of Jesse. Let me find Isaiah here. Um, Isaiah chapter 11, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Here, He's talking about a root of Jesse in verse 10. But here he's talking about the branch and the stem of Jesse. And then in verse 2, we have the seven spirits of God. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Uh, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There's seven spirits there. Correspond to the seven spirits of God. Uh, the phrase, Holy Spirit. Just that phrase, Holy Spirit. King James Bible, exactly seven times. The seven candles on the menorah that were, in the, that were in the tabernacle. That's all speaking of the same thing. And so here we are in Revelation 7, and we have the sealing by way of the Holy Spirit uh, to the tribes of Israel, and now the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God, have gone out and they have gathered together all people from all nations and, uh, and peoples and kindreds and tongues it has gathered out all these people from all over the world, from all different locations and tribes and skins and everything, weird food kinds and everything else, and brought them together to stand before the throne of God. I, and and I, I really think that that's why here we're seeing this in Revelation chapter 7. The number 7 represents perfection. Here's, here's another one for you. The 490th chapter of the Bible, 70 times 7. Think about that for a while. Is Psalm 12. It, and it says, the words of the Lord. Jesus said, my words are spirit. Okay? So if you want a good dose of the Holy Spirit... Read the Bible, okay? Uh, my words are spirit, and they are life. Here we have the words of the Lord, our pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Why was God needing to preserve the word of God perfect and intact? Is so that people from all kindreds and nations and peoples and tongues could read it and be saved. Uh, Isaiah 42, verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness, the Bible says, the people who sat in darkness, that was you and I and our forefathers, saw a great light, and that light was Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of of the world. And that light is for the Gentiles. God never, He never anticipated keeping the Gentiles in darkness. And it's just by some accident now the Gentiles be set. No, that was His intention. Isaiah 49 6. And it, just a good rule of thumb, okay? When it comes to humanity or humankind or mankind is concerned, if God created it, He wants to save it. Okay, Isaiah 49, 6, and he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. That's the first part of Revelation 7. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Here again, doesn't matter where they lived doesn't matter what landmass they were on. It doesn't matter anything else that a light was to go out. The same light, by the way, the same light now that lightens the Jew, lightens the Gentile. Um, and I've, I've mentioned this before. John Hagee and probably others have, have, have studied the scriptures and they've scholarly worked on how the... And basically they're saying that... Um, God's going to save the Jews, but he's going to do it a different way 
than he did us. Okay, he's going to give them. He's going to let them build a temple, and they're going to sacrifice little animals again and spill blood all over the place, and they're going to be saved by that by restoring that. That's a, that's a lie. That's a heresy. The same same light that lightens the Gentiles right now. Right now. You and I have already lifted the veil of Moses. Remember the light that was coming. His face was shining so bright that the Jews said, cover that up. We can't look at that. And so they put a veil on it. And Paul said that every time the Jew reads the Old Testament, there's a veil there. But that veil has been lifted in Christ. And so you and I are in Christ. And we already know who that is. One of these days, that when it, when it turns back to them, the veil is going to be taken away. And they're going to go... Wow, that's, they're going to know who that is. It's Jesus. So the same light that lightens the Gentiles lightens Israel. They have to be saved the same way. If Listen to this now. If there is another gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if there is another gospel that some say that's going to save Israel, then it's accursed. Paul said so. In fact, he said it. If any man bring you another gospel, another, another a gospel, another gospel, any other gospel. Four times Paul said that. Let him be accursed. Man, I just, I would not want to be someone who just went out on a limb and said, oh yeah, God's going to save the Israelites some other way. That's, that's just how he's going to do it. You see, that's another gospel, and I, I wouldn't let that come out of my mouth. I sure wouldn't. So it's the same gospel that saves the Gentiles and saves the Jews. Um, all of us. God's going to put them all together and make one out of them one of these days. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, and verse 18. The Bible says, Behold my servant, servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. And he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He's going to reveal his word to them, his judgments and his statutes and his law. He's going to give them the Old Testament. He's going to give them the New Testament. And they're going to, they're going to see out of both eyes. They're not going to be partially blinded like Israel is right now. They're going to see out of both eyes and they're going to have understanding. And God, here's what God's going to do. God's going to take people who are nothing. He's going to take people who have never... It wasn't our people that was gathered around Mount Sinai watching the Ten Commandments. It wasn't our people that, was, it wasn't our people that crossed the Red Sea. It wasn't our forefathers uh, that have fought all these wars and had the land and had King David and Solomon and the temple. and That wasn't our forefathers. And the Jews, if they have anything, they have tremendous pride in who they are and their heritage. I mean a tremendous, we are the Jews. God's going to make them jealous. God's going to put jealousy, just like he did with Esau. God's going to put jealousy upon, upon the Israelite over what the Gentiles have. Let me, let me kind of share this with you. And I'm just speaking from my heart. I have a heart for God's people. And you know, if you should know by now, that I have a heart for Israel. I care about the Jews. I care about their salvation. I, I, the first time I saw um, Joseph embracing his brothers who tried to have him killed and sold him into slavery and him weeping on their shoulders, I, the first time I read that with just any understanding, I wept. And I said, God, you love you love your brethren, Jesus. You love your own people. Think about that. Don't we? We love our own kind. And Jesus loves his brothers. And he can't wait to where he can reveal to them, it is I, Jesus, be not afraid. God sent me to save you. The, what you meant to me for evil 2,000 years ago, God meant to you for good. He can't wait to do that. And so I have a love for the 12 tribes, for the Israelite, for these little Jewish boys and that, that one day I believe they're going to become a mighty army for God, just like God prophesied through Ezekiel. However, um, there are people who are falling into 
Um, and, it, and, you know, I understand, you know, curiosity on, on our part. You know, wow, the Jewish, the Jewish Passover is so cool and, and the little things that they wear, that is so neat. And they're blowing a shofar. And I've been to meetings where they would blow a ram's horn and, and on and on and on. And I, and I get that. I mean, there is a fascination on my part of things Jewish. I, I wouldn't mind learning Hebrew. I think Hebrew is a neat language. But to say that I have to live as the Jews do, or the whole Messianic Hebrew Roots movement, or whatever, that really to understand, and, and it's more than just a curiosity with some people, although with some people it just is a curiosity. But with some people, that it's almost like, man, if you're not doing it the Jewish way, you're not doing it. They almost seem to, th to think that the only real way to understand Yahushua HaMashiach is to go back and learn all the Hebrew traditions and Hebrew things and Hebrew words and Hebrew mindsets and Hebrew rabbis and Hebrew this and Hebrew that is to really just go back and be like Jews. That's not going to provoke Israel to jealousy. And I, I have suspect, okay, I don't know this to be true. I have suspect, if you look in the book of Acts, the, the, the greatest enemies to the gospel of Jesus Christ was not Rome. It was not uh, the uh, idol crafters of Diana. The greatest and most consistently throughout the book of Acts, it was the Jews. I have suspect in this Hebrew roots movement and all this stuff that's going on that behind the scenes, certain men crept in unawares, that behind the scenes are Jews who are not interested in being messianic or being saved. All they're interested in is destroying the true gospel of grace. You know what the true gospel of grace is? Is that not only do we not have to do anything, we can't do anything to be saved. And to stay saved. That's the true gospel. Any movement, I don't care if it's messianic, charismatic, Roman Catholic, I don't care what movement it is. Any movement that says both, number one, you must do something to be saved, and number two, continue to do something to stay saved, is a false gospel. And it's not going to provoke Israel to the jealousy that God intends her to have at some point when God shines his glory through people who have never kept the Ten Commandments, who have never sacrificed a lamb on an altar, who have never eaten matzah. God intends to show that his saving power works without mankind's works, period. It's this little little help for you. He will show judgment to the Gentiles. We're in Matthew 12, verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name, in his name, shall the Gentiles trust. In his name. I, I love it when Jews get saved. The Jewish tradition is a fascination to me. The Jewish language, I think, is a beautiful language. Okay? But I'm a Gentile. I was born a Gentile. I will die a Gentile. I have Gentile ways about me. I have a Gentile language, and I read out of a Gentile Bible. It's an English Bible, and his name in this book is Jesus. And I trust that name. You see, those who are following the Hebrew tradition, um, one of the problems that they have is that you, you will not get a consistency about how the name Jesus really should be in the original Hebrew. It's Yeshua or Yahshua or Yahashua or Yahashua. There, there's no consistency there. At least here, when I read this, I know that his name is Jesus. And I trust that name. And that when I pray, that's whose name I pray in. That's who my God is. That's who my Savior is. And so, it was always the idea of God. His foreknowledge. And we see this here in this prophecy of things that are going to happen in the last days. Here we have people from all over.
every place, every nook and cranny, every hill and holler, okay, every 20-story building and uh, mud hut that there is, igloos, igloo people are going to be saved. It doesn't matter where you lived, where you came from, who your family was, what your lineage was, what your bloodline, it doesn't matter. God's going to save those people. And he saved them, and they're surrounding the throne now in white robes, and I have notes on that. I love it. And then they have palms in their hands, okay? Not, not just like these palms. They have palm branches. Why? Why do they have palm branches in their hands? We'll talk about that next week in the next Pure Bible Study. This is Pastor Mike. Good to be with you today. Glad to be here. Glad to be saved by God's amazing grace. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.